Strange Studies of Strange Stories. After Elizabeth ultimately died, it was inevitable that many people should come forward with counsel, and doubtless equally inevitable that the counsel be so totally diverse. There were two broad and opposed schools. The first considered that Stephen should treasure the memory, though it was not always put like that, for an indefinite period, which, it was implied, might conveniently last him out to the end of his own life. These people attached great importance to Stephen not rushing anything. The second school urged that Stephen marry again as soon as he possibly could. They said that, above all, he must not just fall into apathy and let his life slide. They said he was a man made for marriage, and all it meant. Of course, both parties were absolutely right in every way. Stephen could see that perfectly well. Those were the opening lines of The Stains by Robert Aikman, a story that comes out swinging with a paradox to opposing contradictory ideas that somehow coexist against all logic and reason. Welcome to Strange Studies of Strange Stories. You can find us at strangestories.com and, of course, Patreon. This show exists in both places at once because this is our free show for February. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. And in honor of Valentine's Day, we wanted to have a love theme this month, and nothing says romance like Robert Aikman. <laughs> We're going to be covering Aikman all month, with one exception next week when we'll be discussing a story Aikman particularly liked, How Love Came to Professor Gildea by Robert Hitchens, so two Roberts one month, and only subscribers to our Patreon will get to witness it all. We will also be joined all month by our reader, Greg Johnson, whom you've just heard. Greg is an amazing actor and an artist, as well as an Aikman superfan. Please check out his Etsy page. He makes amazing props, things that you just can't live without. He's super at everything. Visit his Etsy store. We'll link out in the show notes. Thank you, Greg, once again for lending us your talents. Now, if we're going to be reading Aikman, I know two things. One. I am going to have uncomfortable dreams. And two, we got to talk to Jeremy Dyson. <laughs> Both things are true. And lucky for our listeners, we are joined today by writer, director, and popularizer of Mr. Aikman's work, Jeremy Dyson. Jeremy, welcome back to the show. It is a joy to be here. And it feels naughty because I'm bunking off work. <gasps> <laughs> Excellent. Scandal. I, I've convinced myself this is work. It's all we'll do our best to make picture. it work for you, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, you've got a new book coming out soon called The Warlock Effect. I've got an early copy of it. I've almost finished it. I freaking love it. Please tell people about it. Okay, so The Warlock Effect, which is published in the UK on uh, April the 13th by Hodder and Stoughton. It's a Cold War thriller. It is about a gifted magician, Britain's greatest magician at the time, who gets recruited by the British Secret Service to help them out with a Cold War espionage plot that takes place across Eastern Europe. All is not as it seems. Yeah, barks on his uh, on his mission. Everything about that sounds great. It's been a joy. It was a jo out joy to write. It's co it's co written with Andy Nyman, who I um, co wrote and co directed Ghost Stories with, and it's um, yeah, we had a great fun doing it. It's great. One of the things I just really dig about it, I can't say too much because it'll spoil things, but it's about not just a magician, but his entourage, what he calls a brain trust. So when he's got to figure things out, he's got this whole group of people that help him do all this cool stuff. Uh, it's just... So it's kind of a Houdini's Angels setup. A little bit of the A-team as well. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. Soul. Well, I'll definitely be picking that up. Is there going to be a stateside release? Hopefully, yes. I mean, you know, it's all, all of that's in flux at the moment with the world right sales and what have you, but ultimately, yes. Well, excellent. Folks, keep a lookout for the Warlock Effect. Pick it up in April, if you can, if you're in the UK. We've also got a musical guest on this episode, Fordell Research Unit out of Edinburgh, who I discovered in an interesting way. Within the story we're reading today, The Stains, there's a book titled Lichen, Moss, and Rack, W-R-A-C-K. I looked it up wondering if it was a real book. And I don't think it is because I could not find it, but I did find an album on Bandcamp called Lichen, Moss, and Rack. It had one track on it called The Stains. And the description of the track was made to be played on loop whilst reading the short story The Stains by Robert Aikman. Wow. So I wrote Fordell Research Unit and asked if we could use it. The artist behind the work, Frazier, wrote back and said, fill your boots. So that's what we heard under the opening reading and we'll hear throughout this episode. We'll link out to Fordell Research Unit in the show notes. Lots of great ambient soundscapes available there, so please check it out. This story, The Stains, was first published in Friend of the Show, Ramsey Campbell's anthology, New Terrors, which came out in 1982. 
It won the 1981 British Fantasy Award for Best Short Fiction and now can be found in the Aikman Collection, The Unsettled Dust. This is an impressionistic story and we're going to go through it linearly to discuss as we usually do, but it is long and I'm afraid of getting lost in the synopsis, which possibly could come off as slightly confusing. Mostly I want to hear everybody's thoughts about it. So I actually found a quick, broad synopsis on a personalanthology.com, a site on which writers, critics, and others uh, dream edit personal anthologies of their favorite short stories. This synopsis is by writer, editor, and British Fantasy Award nominee Gary Budden. We'll link out to the entry, but it reads, The Stains focuses on that most Aikman of characters, a sad and unremarkable middle-aged English civil servant, Stephen, whose wife Elizabeth has recently died. Bereft and unsure of what to do with himself, he takes a leave of absence from work to stay with his brother in the North, who has published two important books on lichens. Stephen, perturbed by his brother's wife, begins taking long walks on the moors, and one day he meets a young woman named Nell, who is collecting mosses and lichens. She fascinates him, and he is intensely attracted to her. She becomes a kind of path toward liberation for him, representing a mysterious and ancient world that he craves in the face of creeping modernity. It is strongly implied she is an aspect from nature, a nymph of some sort, she, if she exists at all, is a relic from a deep past that Stephen romanticizes, much like the lichens his brother studies. Then he notices a strange lichen-like stain on her body. They move in together, the walls of the house they attempt to domesticize becoming covered in strange fungal and lichen growths. The stains spread to Stephen's body before nature comes to claim him utterly. Mr. Budden concludes in this article, The Stains is the most intriguing, nuanced, and saddest of Aikman's stories, and its meaning can be endlessly deciphered and interpreted, but never fully pinned down. As with all of his work, that is its great and enduring strength. Now, I didn't have time to get Mr. Budden's permission <laughs> to read that synopsis, so please, folks, check out his books, London Incognita and or Hollow Shores. Gary, thank you for your unwilling participation on this podcast. <laughs> so that's the story, basically. Jeremy, when did you first read or come across this one? And I know that Aikman also wrote this towards the end of his life. What was going on with him as well? Well, it was published posthumously, I think, either the year of his death or the year after. He died in 81, early 81, coming up to the end of, end of February. So coming up to the anniversary of his death. And I had the book in New Terrors. I had a copy of New Terrors uh, that I picked up secondhand, probably mid 80s. But I didn't read it for ages, weirdly. I, I was a bit scared of it because it was long, maybe because it was long. Mm -hmm. And also there was something about it being late period that I had a fear that it might not be as good as some of his prime material. I don't know why. Sure. That's a ridiculous thing to think, really. Oh, I don't know. I can understand that. <laughs> you know, it's like a new New Order album or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe there's an element of that, yes. <laughs> um, for whatever, it was, I, I didn't come to it until, like, remarkably recently, probably, certainly within the past 10 years, probably, maybe a bit, bit, bit more than that. But certainly, you know, it was one of the last things of his that I, that I read and then was blown away by it. It's, it's one of my favorites. I think it's a it's it's a beautiful story. Uh, so delicate, so sensitive. Got so it's kind of all everything. It's all of his his themes are, are, are kind of rehearsed in it. And it's poignant because it's obviously so much about his own mortality, even though it's written about the death of, a, of the lead character's wife is what kicks the story off. He had cancer, as far as I know, he, and it was uh, it was quite a a sort of elongated, drawn out affair for him. So he, he must have been writing it under that shadow. And that Ramsey mm. could probably tell you more about that, but that's that's what it feels like. That's what it seems like when you read the story. Certainly, it feels like somebody dealing, what you say it was an elongated process and so much of the story is about elongating time. Can you make a short amount of time feel very long? Can you throw the clocks out and, and try and enjoy the moments and stretch them out? So I think it had that sense of mortality throughout that really gets to you. A lot of his stories scare me, whereas this one got under my skin in a pretty sad and different way, but yeah. uh, let's just dive into it. It begins with his civil servant, Stephen, who has just lost his wife, Elizabeth. His marriage was pretty important to him and the relationship kept him grounded and gave him a place. They never had kids, though they tried to, and she was herself sick for a long time, and then she finally passed away. Now, he's taken some time off work and left London to go stay with his older brother, Harewood, up north. Not specific. I don't know if it's Yorkshire or not, but there's definitely a lot of moors. His <laughs> brother is a reverend at the parish in the town that they grew up in. His father was the reverend before and his father before him. Harewood is an amateur slash celebrity lichen enthusiast. Harewood also has an adult son that seems to have disappeared in Nepal, which was a kind of a strange 
side fact that never gets addressed again. Yeah, well, there's lots of curious facts, <laughs> as always, with Aikman yeah. about, uh, about that. Just Harewood as well as a character and his circumstances are so almost like a mirror to Stephen, the, the protagonist's uh, uh, own. He feels like a device as much as he does a character in the best possible way, not in a, not in a flimsy way. He's there as counterpoint. It's very musical sort mm -hmm. of thing yeah. and, mm -hmm. uh, and the missing son the fact that he, he's not the only sort of disappearance because Harewood's wife disappears as well I'm sure we'll come on to that but mm. she, she just quietly goes off stage in a not dissimilar way it's all part of you know mortality is obviously one of the major themes of the story mm. in all its forms and so it, it, it's part of that picture definitely but you know the bigger theme across the whole story which is an eightman perennial is is the rational life versus the irrational or however you want to express that the conscious life versus the unconscious life a theme that becomes more and more pertinent to us with every passing year and i think that you know we should one of the things that accounts for eightman's enduring appeal as a writer is, is that it, there was an element of profit about him. You know, he, he saw what problems were with the modern world and and that was one of the things he was he was writing about and responding to. And this story is is a collection of all of that. Agreed. And I certainly it articulates how we live in the real world and we also live in the world in our heads simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. completely agree. Yeah. Just jumping in on the North, it's, it's very mm -hmm. interesting, isn't it, that, uh, that the North is, uh, is this almost mythical space. The fact, for yeah. a writer, who's so good on detail and specificity and tiny little details the fact that he leaves that vague as he does often in his stories which i think mm. is deliberate it's about creating a very dreamlike ambiguous space that the it's technique you know that the, the reader then creates his own space that fills that and it works really really well i mean i absolutely see it as the landscape around where i live which is mm -hmm. that's the why yeah so well we're on the other sides of the same moor aren't we uh -huh, so yeah <laughs> we, we know it well and it's very easy to imagine these events up on ilkley moor slash rombold's moor whatever you want to call it well it was interesting that the north represented this kind of fantasy land when now i believe that his brother works it's a lineage right their father ran this church and right. their grandfather ran this church so i assumed that Stephen grew up here, or it, it would have been very familiar with the, oh, yeah. the area. And he's made this trip many, many, many times, and yet it still seems unfamiliar to him, which was a strange way to present the, the environment. There's also that aspect, too, when one moves away from home and they come back and things mm. change. It's never the same place, and you can never go home. That I know it's a bit cliche, but maybe there is a bit of that in this as well. It's all bubbling under the surface, isn't it? It's part yeah. of the picture, the picture, the strange picture that he paints. As he visits his brother, uh, Stephen likes to go on these walks on the moors rather than hang around the house with his sister-in-law, Harriet, who he feels a bit unease with. Yeah, he refers to her as a restless woman, jumpy and puzzling, the reverse of all that had seemed best about Elizabeth. So again, we have that mirror image of his deceased wife. And I, I was already obsessing about dualities in the text just from that opening, that he's a city skeptic, whereas his brother, as Jeremy said, is this country reverend, like a mirror image of him. The brother's wife is the reverse of his wife. He There was even small things like he was seeing a half Sudanese doctor that he couldn't really understand in London. And later, Harriet recommends a West Bengali doctor for him. So there's these two foreign physicians in the text. Mm -hmm. And of course, the dominant imagery in the story is of lichens, which are a dual life form, a symbiotic partnership of fungus and algae, two things simultaneously working together. It's very clearly threaded throughout the text. In fact, Aikman himself calls out some dualities later on in the story. It's something that he's well aware of. I think that goes back to what we were just talking about, which is that returning Aikman theme of the rational against the irrational. The thing that I find really interesting is um, there's a, uh, an English writer, thinker, philosopher called Ian McGilchrist. I don't know if you're aware of him. Mm -mm. About 10 or 12 years ago, wrote a book called uh, The Master and His Emissary, uh, which is a sort of popular science slash philosophy book and and recently he's kind of done a sequel to it which is this enormous two volume sort of 1500 page work called the matter with things and his whole thesis is that everything is about we have we have our brains have evolved with with two hemispheres the left brain is very logical and rational and governs all our our rational detailed thinking and the right brain is where our creative intuitive 
perhaps unconscious side is located. And McGurk's thesis is that from the Enlightenment onwards, so for the past, in the West, for the past uh, sort of four or five hundred years, the Enlightenment scientific revolution is a very left brain driven phenomena. Hmm. And that what's happened in our culture is that everything's got out of whack and that we've teetered too far into the logical and the rational. So to the extent that that's the only legitimate area to be and that everything on the other side of it is kind of stuff and nonsense and derided if, or, or just completely ignored, deemed to be a childish or primitive or of no importance... And McGilchrist thinks that this is lethal and that, that if this remains unaddressed, it will lead to the most terrible consequences, possibly our own destruction or at least the destruction of, uh, of that culture. And it's a fascinating, fascinating idea. And it absolutely maps one on one onto Aikman. You know, that's everything that Aikman was writing about in a more intuitive, poetic way. But that was how he felt. Hmm. And that's that's what most of his work is about, or certainly in part, most of his work is about. And this story, 100 percent is like a, is like an illustration of McGilchrist's thesis. It's, so it's really interesting when that happens, you know, when you get that sort of uh, you see that overlap, overlap between different thinkers, different writers and the connections between them. Certainly. I, I think later in the story, Aikman says the text says something about the only purpose of science is to speed up time or to make things go faster. It's, uh, you know, that he's trying so hard to hold on to these last moments and Science is in opposition to that. There's a spot on Stephen's walks through the moors called Burton's Clow. It's a, a vague valley or extended hollow. It marks the halfway point of his walk. And an important thing about Harriet is that we've said that he's kind of put off by her. And part of that is that she's like a mother-like figure. She regulates Stephen's days while he's staying with them. Lunches at this time, suppers at this time. There's all sorts of other things during the day he's got to be back for. So he knows he can only walk so far before having to return home. Given that most of the farming work out here is now automated, there's rarely anybody around. Mm. But one morning, he's surprised to see somebody in that hollow. If he had been in the Alps, his shadow might have fallen in the early autumn sun across the figure below. But in the circumstances, that idea would have been fanciful, because at the moment, the sun was no more than a misty bag of gleams in a confused sky. Nonetheless, as Stephen's figure passed comparatively high above, the figure below glanced up at him. Stephen could see that it was the figure of a girl. She was wearing a fawn shirt and pale green trousers, but the nature of her activity remained uncertain. Stephen glanced away, then glanced back. She seemed still to be looking up at him, and suddenly he waved to her, though it was not altogether a kind of thing he normally did. She waved back at him. Stephen even fancied she smiled at him. It seemed quite likely. She resumed her task. I underline, the sun was no more than a misty bag of gleams in a confused sky. It was a surprisingly sort of playful construction for Aikman, I thought. But a fairly accurate uh, depiction of most of the the sky here up in Yorkshire. <laughs> That's true. Now, Stephen is attracted to this girl, but uh, he walks on and he makes sure to sh circle back a little bit later to see if she's still there. He's playing it cool. I really felt for him and his nervousness. You know, he's a little adolescent in a way because he's been married so long. She sees him and says, are you lost? Are you looking for someone? And I felt like this was some clever dialogue that could read as an offhanded greeting or it could be about his entire life. He mm -hmm. responds, no, I'm really just filling in time. Thank you very much. He explains that he's staying with his brother. She says that she's collecting stones for her father because he's into moss and lichen. And Stephen thinks, oh, here's my inn. My brother is lichen famous. He's a lichen authority. And she says, oh, my father's not an authority on anything. And she says that she lives nearby and tells him that uh, there's a spring that's up in these moors around here. And he's never heard of it before, which is surprising to him. And he gets her to agree to meet with him the next day so that she can show him where the spring is. Her name is Nell. He writes a little reminder note of the time and the date and gives it to her and she puts it in her breast pocket and that gets us into the next section. The next day he finds her and then they walk together to this place. He's completely out of breath by the time he gets to her because he's a little older. I mean, I think he's in his 50s maybe. As an older guy, he's of course worried about coming off that way. And so he's mm -hmm. trying to hide his exhaustion. And they don't really ever specify how old Nell is supposed to be, but I get the impression she's in her 20s. Yeah, although at times there are moments when uh, she might even be younger. I mean, he mm -hmm. definitely uses the word girl and she's, mm -hmm. you know, there's a sort of, uh, if not in years, in feel and that sort of adolescent feel to her or 
So she she could just as easily be late teens. I mean, remember, it's being written, it's written in the early 80s when that still didn't carry the problematic overtones that it does now. Sure. So he's mm-hmm. coming from a more um, romantic place with, with that. I think it's probably worth contextualising that mm-hmm. as well, I think. Sure. And while we're on it, that is another a, a recurring Aitman theme is that, that age gap, you know, Aitman's one of his most famous stories, Ringing the Changes, is about um, a couple with a great age gap between them, Gerald and Fryn in Ringing the Changes. Gerald is probably about a Stephen's age and, and Fryn is 21, 22. And that was something that is worth noting, His that age gap was from his parents. There was that oh. kind of age gap between his own mother and father. Without playing crass amateur psychologist about, sure. about that, it was it's worth noting. It's something that recurs in his stories and finds its echo in his in his own life. Yeah, but not necessarily just men either. In uh, Mr. Miller, there is an age difference in a relationship where he's an older woman. Also, I think in Swords, he's a very young guy as well and he gets involved with an older more woman. experienced yes uh, yeah that's true so yeah that dynamic is is something that he returns to you're right i can understand my parents had a 20 year age gap and it has shown up in some of the, the things that i've worked on as well but it also yeah. reminded me of uh, john Wyndham, who also seemed to have those kinds of things going on because he was an older guy who married late in life and, and, and of course one of his novels trouble with lichen features lichen <laughs> and and the lichen in that story affects directly affects age and particularly female aging so that's interesting as well isn't it i, I mean of course, Aikman would have been aware of that book. That book was written in the early 60s, I guess, and mm. if not before, and 20 years probably before this story. So it was floating around as a as a, an idea. When he sees her, she's wearing the exact same clothes that she had on the day before. She seems to have grown up in the area and still lives on the moors. She doesn't really know much about modern life from their conversations. He tells her that he's the recent widower and a civil servant. And then she says that her father says that all politicians are evil. And he goes, well, I'm not a politician. I'm I'm a civil servant. That's that's a different thing. She then drops that her father can't read because he doesn't have eyes. (laughs) Not that he's blind. He doesn't have eyes. And she doesn't elaborate on that ever, which is really creepy and awesome. And she also says that she's never with him by day, only at night. Even though it's warm out, she says she sleeps in front of a fire. Quote, father always likes a fire. He's a cold mortal. Firstly, that line, it's so interesting that he left that in. Father always likes a fire. He's a cold mortal. Because it's going to be contradicted when we get to the story's end. Yeah. That's the last thing he is. You know, he's presented very much as a spirit. Certainly not a mortal. So on a technical level, it sort of feels like something from a first draft when Aitman's writing it and doesn't yet know where he's going or, or what, mm-hmm. what the resolution's going to be. And then gets to the end and goes through his, his process of drafting and the whole the idea evolves. But he's chosen to keep that in. Now, whether that's just misdirection or whether it's to, to deliberately create a sense of unease, all of those things. But it's a really interesting choice, the fact, you know, the fact that he's left that contradiction in there. Maybe it's her just trying to get him off the scent, as in, uh, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I'm not an android. (laughs) Uh, It is a funny way to say, if you were talking about, oh, we always have the thermostat high because my wife runs a little cold. It's that kind of thing. He's a cold mortal, (laughs) just like an android. Although I thought maybe it was a play on mortality, because the one thing that's mentioned about him over and over is that he's frightening. I felt that perhaps he was some spirit of death or death itself and and maybe that's why well he's certainly revealed to be that as you say it could it could just be that foreshadowing foreshadowing yeah. that discovery nell explains that there are lots of abandoned houses on the moors and that she could help him find one to live in that's what she and her father did she says so eventually nell leads them leads them up to a small clear pool of water it's deep and it's heaving in the center, and it's well hidden from the paths. There's just this serpentine rabbit run that leads to it. It makes no sense that the path wouldn't lead directly to it. He imagines that all rivers in Britain must flow from here because it's so clear and pure. We came across a bottomless pool like this only a few months ago when we covered one other by Manly Wade Wellman. I was wondering, what's the significance of this bottomless clear pool? Within the story, it's a a plot device on, on the superficial level, and it gets paid off really beautifully in the in the denouement, mm. because it's the coroner speculates that it's the cause of Stephen's death, or if not the coroner, other people around when they when they're trying to work out what killed him. We'll obviously come on to how he ends, but the the idea is that the the pool is 
bottomless, mm. genuinely, it's an abyss. He looked into it and the shock of it killed him. The shock of staring into the abyss. So this, you know, it's it's pure Nietzsche. Mm. Sort of Nietzschean idea of staring into the abyss and the abyss staring back into him. But there's also Lovecraft in there. There's a sort of cosmic horror. The idea of looking into infinity and it just being unbearable to a mortal. And so overwhelming that it literally kills you when you have to confront the true nature of the infinite. And on the other side of that, there is the idea that a wellspring is the source of life. It's where all this nature comes from. And in that Wellman story that we covered, it was actually a portal to another world. There was a, an mm-hmm. entity, a creature came out of it, and it was a way to the beyond or from the beyond. So it was it's this wellspring of life, but it comes from elsewhere. Back to the duality, it, Stephen thinks, sees it as a beautiful thing. No question. He's, he's mm. In this first encounter, it, it's all about the beauty of it and the fact that it contains or is connected to his death. Mm-hmm. At the end, there, there you are. It's the same thing of the these opposing ideas contained in one thing. In a more practical way, it also reminds me of a story we did a long time ago, The Striding Place. I think that's Gertrude Atherton, oh, really? and that was about the Strid, right? That's, uh, that's up my where, house. But you think it's shallow and it's quite deep, so people die in there because they try to jump over it and fall in, and it's subterranean caverns and things that you can't see from the the surface, right? As they're gazing into the pool, he notices a small stone house behind her. It's like it materialized out of nowhere, and they go and check it out. The house is not in bad shape, and there's a bed upstairs that doesn't seem very old. Stephen insists that someone must be living there, but Nell says it's empty. She says it's been empty for centuries, and he says, no, either someone is moving in or moving out, which again, I thought was a great dual state because both look the same. She suggests that he live in this house, and he says, well, I'm committed to staying with my brother for the time being because he's not fit. And she says, does worrying about him do you any good? Not much, I'm afraid. Does your worry about everything do you any good? None whatsoever, Nell. None at all. You know, that's a direct reference to the Gospels. That's that's Sermon on the Mount. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life, says Jesus. Uh, And then it goes on in a minute. She makes a reference, another reference to the same Bible passage. So Mm. that's a very very conscious religious, uh, unusual for Aikman, who, who, whilst being very spiritual, uh, is not by any stretch of the imagination a Christian writer. And yet that is a, that's a very Christian reference. Lots of references, you're kind of struck because it's around the same time. She's talking about her father, my father this, my father that, that also feels quite gospel-ish as well. Yeah. And she said, he says, how will we live? And she says, as the birds. That that is, that's from the same passage. Yeah. It's literally, Mm. you know, it's Matthew chapter six. Now that he says, suppose I was to fall in love with you. And then she says, then you would not have to go back. So she seems to be open to this idea of them and her together, which seems a little odd to me because in the writing, she gives very little, like there's no flirting or anything really going on. It's all just uh, exchanging information back and forth. He puts his arm around her and he puts his hand on her breast about the pocket where his note is. He's actually considering moving to this house in a real way because he's thinking of all the shopping he'd have to do to make it habitable, something that she seems willing to help with, but she cannot guarantee she'll visit him there every day. She says her father can't know, and if he discovers that she's visiting, he'll keep her at home and send out her sister instead. He has powers. He's very frightening. Well, he finally makes his move. He kisses her and they return upstairs. It says it would perhaps have been more suitable if he had been leading the party, but that might be a trifle, which I believe means she led the way upstairs to the bedroom. Mm -hmm. She's both expectant and resistant, lying face down on the bed. He begs her to turn over. And when she does, it says he saw that her eyes were neither closed nor open, neither looking at him nor looking at anything but him. And later it says he couldn't make out whether she was taught or relaxed. Everything is in a Schrodinger's cat state (laughs) in in this story. There's more McGilchrist for you, more left brain, right brain. And the other place that that idea emerges is is the yin and yang symbol. Mm. You you know, you have the, the white paisley in the back black paisley in perfect balance both with a little dot of the other contained within them which is another symbol of the necessity of balancing the rational and the irrational to live well or to live properly balancing the order and the chaos is another way of expressing that Hmm. idea so yeah all of that is on point now when she turns he sees a mark on her that was hidden by her shirt it says on the skin between her right shoulder and her right breast was a curious brownish grayish bluish irregular mark or patch and in this moment she's very lifeless in bed with him at first 
but then she takes over. He says she was like a maenad or an oread, which is a mountain nymph. A maenad, by the way, is a disciple of Bacchus. That would be going wild with passion. Yeah. It, it said she had unusually shaped ears at one point, too. So I thought, OK, is she actually a nymph? At the end of the section, it says Nell's flawed body was celestial. Nell herself was more wonderful than the dream of death. Nell could not possibly exist. So is the author just telling me? <laughs> yeah. Well, and also, isn't that, I mean, stop, stop and look at that sentence. Nell himself was more, herself was more wonderful than the dream of death. I mean, we've got to interrogate that. What's yeah. wonderful <laughs> about the dream of death? There's a, an inversion for you. It's awfully obvious that death is a wonderful thing. I, for some, if life isn't joyful, it yeah. is an escape. And yeah. so I guess he's not in a very happy place. So yeah. for him, death is something that he is looking forward to. Him saying that Nell could not possibly exist. Does she not exist? Maybe she's a figment of his imagination and this isn't happening at all. After the deed is done, he asks about her sister, and she says, oh, she's not like me. You wouldn't like her. She's referenced that she has a sister before. It seems like a common young girl's response. I'm totally different than her. But it's more than that. It says she's made quite differently, and that they call her different things at different times. So we have some thoughts about the father, but what's going on with this sister? Another side of the coin, or the triangle, really. And he's playing, technically speaking, he's playing the same game. It's another unresolved detail that goes off like a little bomb in your imagination because he gives you just enough to, to conjure with and to play with. What does that mean? Hmm. And, you know, it's it, it's one of the most powerful things about his writing that, that makes it work so well is he, his judgment about when to do that and how much or how little to give you and know that it will still have an impact and have an effect is is always spot on. And that's the case here because it all makes sense. It's sort of within, there's, within its own dream yeah. logic you mm -hmm. completely it doesn't throw you it doesn't be, feel like nonsense it rather feels like a work, well worked out myth or fairy tale yeah uh, and that just adds to the unease and yet the strange plausibility of what Stephen's going through and it scared me a little bit I, you know from somebody i think of as a horror writer this was such a literary story and yet this character who never shows up scared me <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah definitely no question. It's properly creepy, unsettling and uneasy and just makes you ask so many questions about what the f*** is going on. Now, he tells her that they will meet there tomorrow and begin settling down. She warns him she might not be able to make it. Her father can't read books, but he could read minds. <laughs> he knows he's got to get back to the rectory or Harriet's going to have the police out looking for him. He's way overdue. And so they part. But when he gets there... It seems that Harriet, as Jeremy had referenced earlier, has been taken off stage. She had some seizure of some kind and she's gone to the hospital. An ambulance came to get her. His brother doesn't actually know when this happened. He was in with his specimens and he says, well, to tell you the truth, my watch runs slow. I don't really keep track of time. So again, we're playing with that idea that time is elastic. The two brothers make dinner very badly. Stephen uses the opportunity to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to not be a burden during this difficult time. I'm going to go ahead and leave. So he's just thinking about, oh, man, this is a get out of jail free card uh. that this went down. I can split and go be with this girl without having to explain anything. And Harewood, his brother, is on board because it's implied he wouldn't mind being a little alone because there's this young servant in the the house doreen mm -hmm. she's divorced no kids younger a domestic he's supposed to have some interest in her it says which i think maybe there are rumors that he's mm -hmm. lustful for her Harewood has no problem with him leaving even tells him where he can find a local drunk that will lend him a land rover so again we have that mirroring of experiences when stephen goes to bed that night he notices in his bedroom that there's a stain on the wallpaper right above his bed and has this dream that nell is serving him water from a blotched and blemished chalice mm -hmm. the spot on her that he had seen when they were making love is now infecting his surroundings and even dreams. Speaking of dreams, when he creeps out to get water in the night, he comes across his sleeping brother. This really did my head in. He, his brother's also dreaming, and it could be that he's having like a lascivious dream about the servant girl, but I wondered, is he dreaming Stephen's experience on the moors? Does Stephen even exist, or is Stephen a, a fragment of Harewood's imagination? Because it says he's murmuring, turn over, no, right over, you can trust me. It's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. Again, it's that please turn over, please turn over, which had happened in the previous scene. I mean, and that's, you know, well, it's, as you say, it's more mirroring, it's more presenting Howard as this, this counterpoint or this rhyme, if you like, to Stephen's experience. And in doing that, it sort of emphasizes more of what Stephen's going through and 
just the strangeness of the whole thing. And yeah. yet, as always with Aikman, at his best, it it feels there's something believable about it. You know, it has this plausibility that uh, we've already referred to. Mm. It's akin to the the sort of strange experiences that people will tell you about, odd coincidences. Yeah. Moments of synchronicity or deja vu. It smells of that rather than something contrived or mm -hmm. invented. Yeah, I think that there's a point in the story where he's referring to Elizabeth and Harriet as both having, I think Harriet's obsessed with the Orient. His wife had a, an obsession. He says there's often similarities between sisters-in-law, and that feels very much like what you're saying. People would go, you know, these two brothers wound up marrying the same type of person. They have obsessions about different things, but they're obsessed in the same way. Mm -hmm. A duality you would find in life. Now, the next day, Stephen gets this Land Rover, gets some supplies, drives up to the house, and she's there. It's almost as if he can't believe it's happening. It says, they unloaded the Land Rover together as if everything were perfectly real. <laughs> So like, why wouldn't it be perfectly real? That's, again, it's a strange thing to say. Well, and it raises that question because the story is constructed in such a way that she absolutely could be a figment of his imagination. Yeah. There are no episodes or incidents where Nell interacts with anybody else. Mm -hmm. it Steam's always alone with her. Even later in the story, when they move out into, into an urban environment, she's only ever with him. So that must be deliberate on his part to give you the space to ask that question. To, to wonder about yeah. that. You could certainly read the whole thing as happening in his head and it makes perfect sense. Unlike yeah. uh, uh, many of his other st uh, stories where that's not the case, where mm. the strange events are definitely witnessed unequivocally by more than one person. Yeah. That's a definite choice on his part. Now, Nell tells him that she's run away from home and she asks Stephen to take care of her, which is, I thought, very strange to say because she doesn't need anybody to take care of her. In fact, out here, she'll be the one that's really going to have to take care of him. Is this a role that she's playing? Well, I think she's fulfilling his need. Mm. She, I think she knows it's what he wants to do. So in that sense, yes, role playing in the um, in the positive, playful sense of that. That he needs to take care of somebody. He needs yeah. to be the man in yeah. the relationship, what that means to him. And she's going to let him do that. Yes. Which is an act of kindness, you could say. Yeah. Of that consideration. Now, he actually physically carries her across the threshold, even though she seems stronger and in better shape than him. Over the next few weeks, they have this ideal life. She washes her clothes in the pool and walks around naked. Clothes that she says that she just found? No follow-up questions to that? No. He might have had some earlier, but I think at this point, Stephen is learning to unlearn time. He's learning to unlearn preconceptions. When he's pondering how well this is all going, he says, things do not go like that in real life. So he's just trying trying to ignore what we decide is real life. And she's supernaturally good at housekeeping and foraging and fixing things. Yeah. Uh, I kept thinking of that trope. She's the ultimate manic pixie dream girl. <laughs> There's a great take on this story on the site tour.com, an early sponsor of our show. They have a series called Reading the Weird by Ruthanna Emrys and Anne M. Pillsworth, and they both give their takes on this story which I'll link out in our show notes. It's very much worth a read if you're interested in this story, because as you might imagine, it reads differently for a female audience. Sure. They vary in their takes on it, but one of my favorite quotes is from Ruthanna who writes, part of my dissatisfaction with the story stems from the story's treatment of its women who are deeply symbolic, but can totally be counted on to cook and do the dishes. <laughs> That's, which is funny, but but also you could also see it is a, is a critique of men. Oh yeah, because they're useless at it. They can't cope without the women, which is always my wife's observation. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> even when we're trying, it's fairly pathetic. <laughs> Stephen decides that he and Nell have to go back to London so that he can quit his job and get his pension. Surprisingly, she's able to go with him on the bus back, the dirty, splotchy bus back. I thought she might only be a spirit of the woods, so the fact that she was going to London surprised me. What surprised me even more, or maybe less, is that she's a perfect travel companion, never complains. Even when the bus stalls and they have to go out and wait on the side of the road, she's totally cool about it. This is truly impossible. <laughs> When they get back to his place in London, he finds a package left, a book that was meant for his brother. It's a book about lichens and moss. And there it is, lichen, moss, and rack, usage and abusage in peace and war, a military 
and medical abstract. And then here's an interesting local fact. On our moor, on Ilkley mm. Moor, it's one of the few places that something called, is it sphagnum moss? It's called, it's a particular type of moss that is oh, used in war. It was used as a dressing for wounds. It's got ah. a very high, it's very high natural antiseptic properties. Mm. So it may be gesturing in that direction. Mm. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. So then if you have these splotches and patches on you, that could be a good thing because those are healing you up. More duality. Yeah. There you go. Wow. Now, when he goes back to the office, he sees his co-workers, he's welcome back, but he's told to get over the death of your wife. Best thing to do, lose yourself in your work. All you need to do is throw yourself into work. Don't think about anything. Just keep busy. He doesn't tell them right away that he's going to leave, that he wants to retire. He's just, it doesn't feel right for him to break it off right away. So he just goes to work for a day. Yeah. I also, the, uh, I think it's Thread is his co-worker that says that to him. And I thought he had a good comeback for that. He says, you know, you're talking about yourself oh. <laughs> just on a practical level when he's giving him that advice. Yeah, it's not really for me. That's about you because he had lost a, a parent and that's how he dealt with it. Mm. He mentions that he fears he's reached the male climacteric, which was new vocabulary for me. I'd never heard that before. It's also known as andropause or male menopause. Reading about it, most men undergo this between the ages of 40 to 55 when there's a deficiency of testosterone, which results in decreased physical, mental, and sexual activity. I would have looked into it more, but I just didn't have the energy. <laughs> <laughs> there's a bath in the basement of this office, a swimming pool, and one of his co-workers suggests that they go down for a swim because he's not looking very healthy. So he goes, maybe it'll perk you up a bit. When he takes off his shirt, the guy notices something on Stephen's back. He says, the best I can do is that it looks rather like a sort of thing that you occasionally see on trees. I think mm. it may simply be stuck onto you. Would you like me to give it a tug? Deliberate double entendre. <laughs> where it must be deliberate where he says that either it's something that will just come off with a good rub which well unless it's my dirty mind anyway. no i <laughs> thought the same thing uh co-workers going down to the baths together just seemed a little and odd another to me. thing to say is they have absurd names his co-workers one's called thread and the other's called tremble you know yeah. sort of dickensian nomenclature <laughs> i thought so too yeah uh, definitely he's you know the, the civil service is standing in for the, the rash world, you know, the world mm -hmm. of the everyday, the quotidian, and it's absurd. Yeah. It's, it's an absurdity in the face of mortality. But the fact that in his real life, he does have this practice of going to the subterranean pool, I thought was interesting, given what he's imagining or mm. what's happening out in the in the north. Yeah, yeah. And more duality, more, more rhyming and echoing. Stephen says no to the swim after that, because it's he's kind of wigged out that there's something on him. He gets dressed goes back home. Seems to put his friend off as well, who says, yeah, I don't think I want to swim either, I guess, after looking at that. And they just spend the day drinking. Obviously, Stephen's just going to ignore this. He doesn't go to a mirror and look at it or no. anything. And, and that continues on through the rest of the story, that these things are happening and he just keeps looking the other direction. I was just reading an article from a physician the other day who's 70 and was diagnosed with cancer, who was talking about, he was diagnosed with late stage cancer. He's a doctor. He treats these things. Uh -huh. But even though he he just ignored all the signs in himself. So even in somebody who's an expert at this, it's the human condition to just want it. I don't like what that Nobody speaks. wants to look into yeah. the abyss, do they? No. no. Now, when he returns home, Nell tells him that she's been out foraging all day in the city, <laughs> which is crazy to me. Yeah, how? Dumpster diving, I guess. I think she said she found something on the roof, is what she said at one point. Anyway, the next morning, he notices the house has patches, stains on the walls more than it had before. As with the stain on his back, he ignores it, heads to work where he finally quits. Now his pension is small, but it's going to be more than enough for what he needs, just living out of the moors, living off the land. The office guys make note that he doesn't look well. And with that, he's gone from civil service. The next day, they leave, and he remembers that he wanted to buy her a dress. Right. So they take a little diversion off the road on the way back to the north. He picks her up a dress. They get to their poolside cottage. Finally, they settle. And he's doing what she tells him to do more and more at this point. There's a sense of surrendering mm -hmm. that's happening in this last phase of the story. Also, when he removes his driving gloves, he sees that his hands are blotched. So it's spreading not just in the environment, but on him. When she removes her dress... Stephen notices that the mark on her chest and shoulder is gone. Now, things get a bit weird now that they're there, back up north. Stephen begins hearing Schumann, which is music that he listened to when he had sex with Elizabeth. She liked to have this music playing when they had sex. But Nell can't hear the music. Then one night, the music begins to fade, and at its place, Stephen can hear a snuffling sound outside, and he looks out the window. He can't see anything. Nell keeps trying to distract him by holding him, 
and squeezing him, but he can't stop focusing on that noise. But whatever animal is that? He demanded. She released his hands and curled up like a child in distress. She had begun to sob. Oh, Nell, he cried. He fell on her and tried to reach her. Her muscles were as iron, and he made no impression at all. In any case, he could not stop attending to the snuffling, if that was the proper word for it. He thought it was louder now. The noise seemed quite to fill the small, low, dark, remote room, to leave no space for renewed love, however desperate the need, however urgent the case. Suddenly, Stephen knew. A moment of insight had come to him, an instinctual happening. He divined that outside or inside the little house was Nell's father. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, so there we go. We referred to this earlier of uh, the father being described as a cold mortal, and here he is as some amorphous spirit. Some who's, uh, thing. Who's, but who's having a physical impact nonetheless because he's he's out stuff. snuffling and sniffing around yeah. I, I had i admit that i thought that that father stuff was never going to pay off it was just aikman strangeness but it pays off in a big way here it becomes like a major threat and this is pretty dramatic this is almost like something that would be in a movie it's elemental and dangerous isn't it there's a yeah. as you say real peril in there funny that the thing it really made me think of was um mythago wood in fact, much of the story resonates with that. You know, the Robert Holstock novel. Do you know Do you know that novel? No, I don't. I don't, no. Ah, oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful. But it's a series of novels. Um, but Mythago Wood is the first one. But it has a lot in common with Aikman in that it's about the bursting through of the mythological into the everyday. And uh, yeah, there's definitely an echo of that. It was written after, uh, a few years after this story. Oh, there's an echo mm. of, of this moment in, to be found in that novel. Now, he asks her what they should do, but she's freaking out. They sneak downstairs, and Nell says that they should just hide. And there's a trap door in the house. There's a stone slab that Stephen never knew was there. And she guides him inside, and she goes with him into this little hidey hole. All the houses have a place like this, Nell explained. They sit in the dark, listening to the snuffling about He wants to know why they have these little hidey holes, and she says to keep their treasure. And he tells her she is his treasure, and she says he is hers. Now, so there's another little touch of the Gospels there, and, you know, the warning in uh, the Sermon on the Mount not to store up treasure on earth, but to keep your treasure in heaven. Uh, It's just that that use of the word treasure that you wonder if that's another deliberate thing on her part, uh, since it's coming from her mouth. There's also a bit about there's a pipe they have to breathe through <laughs> that which is such a horrible detail and and <laughs> classic Aikman yeah yes. because it's so it's so real because it's so specific that there would be a pipe oh god and suffocating to, yeah. to have to be in a little space essentially snorkeling and it she says well it's dangerous because he may come through the pipe yes exactly <laughs> what does it mean oh gosh and she whispers he's directly above us he's poised that's so loaded. That's great. Like poised. It's like he's going to pounce. He's going to attack. He's not a, an old man. He's a thing. Steven thinks about how all this feels like he's in some weird opera and it's bizarrely romantic to him. Yeah, he's thinking of an opera that he'd seen in the past with Elizabeth. It says, I love you, said Stephen. No doubt the chap in the opera had said something to the like effect, but had taken more time over it. Time. That was always the decisive factor. But time had been mastered at last. I love you, said Nell, snuggling even closer, manifesting her feeling in every way she could. And we have a break. Some time passed, or hasn't. Yeah, there's a break in the story, and then we get to the last section, which starts with, Curiously enough, it was at the verge of the small, lustrous pool that Stephen's body was ultimately found. So it seems days or weeks have passed since he died. It says there... There was no ordinary skin anywhere, which could mean a few things. It could mean that, like, he was picked by animals, his body was picked, or that he turned to lichen, or his flesh transformed into this other thing. Now, Harewood is the heir and has to take over the responsibilities for the funeral and whatnot. Doreen is very involved in all of this, the domestic servant, and it seems that she's kind of taken over as the matron of the rectory. With no, with no li- reference made to what's happened to Harriet. She's not no. like Harriet's not mentioned at all. Right. <laughs> and when they lay him to rest in the ground, Harewood notices that there's all sorts of lichen about that he doesn't recognize. Yeah. As Stephen's will had been rendered ineffective by Elizabeth's decease, Harewood, as next of kin, had to play a part 
whether he felt competent or not, in winding everything up. Fortunately, Doreen had been taking typing lessons and had bought a second-hand machine with her own money. The flat was found to be in the most shocking state, almost indescribable. It was as if there had been no visitors for years, which, as Harewood at once pointed out, had almost certainly been more or less the case since the onset of Elizabeth's malady an epoch ago. A single, very unusual book about Harewood's own speciality was found. It had been published in a limited edition, a minute one, and at a price so high that Harewood himself had not been among the subscribers. "'Poor fellow,' said Harewood. "'I never knew that he was really interested. One can make such mistakes.' The valuable book had of course to be disposed of for the benefit of the estate. Stephen's car was so far gone that it could be sold only for scrap, but in the event it never was sold at all because no one could be bothered to drag it away. If one knows where to look, one can see the bits of it still. I love that last line because it's such a fairy tale ending. Mm. It's like the ending of a folk tale where, you know, an oral story that yeah. has grown out of, like the one on Ilkley Moor, where the story about the two prominent rocks, the cow and calf, are that yeah. there was a giant called Rombold who'd who'd thrown them around. So that, you know, when you go up there with the kids, you can say, and look, there's the rocks that Rombold threw all those hundreds, thousands of years ago. They're still mm-hmm. there today. Yeah, maybe there's a wrecked, uh, a wrecked car that has, that has been <laughs> overgrown, and this is the story that was made up about it. Yeah. But the, there also feels to me a sadder end to it where everything goes everything is going to fall apart everything maybe there's going to be little bits of it here and there left but even this big strong steel object is taken away to the elements and there'll be nothing left don't store up your treasure on earth that's the thing because it all rusts everything rusts it's the same thing same idea that's all growth as well isn't it so that's life just existing in a different form it's change and decay, you know, it's it's not growth, is it? Because it's it's decay. It's the, it's going in the other direction. Right. I mean, it depends from which perspective you look at it, of course. Sure. From the from the perspective of human culture, um, the car is broken down. But from the perspective of lichen and life and pure <laughs> life, yeah, it's, it's, it's growth. It's growth, yeah. <laughs> Just as we are tasty food for the worms and the ducks that eat the worms. As the, as the song has it. <laughs> <laughs> Food for ducks doesn't have the same uh, ring to it. <laughs> there's a, I mean, there's a couple of things that, that sort of jump out to me as well. There's this young, old dichotomy tension in the romance that we, we've mentioned, but there's a thing that's definitely in Ringing the Changes with their version of it, that it's about a, a, an older man thinking that he can cheat time, cheat death, cheat mortality mm. by right. getting himself a younger, a younger model, as it yeah, were. Sure. Mm. Uh, you know that that somehow is going to buy him an extra thirty years. He's nastily disabused of that idea by the end of the story. This is softer and gentler than that because this is actually sort of the inversion of it. That story was right at, at the start of Aitman's career, published in his first collection. Here's this one that was published posthumously. There's something more benevolent in the in the young the young person is carrying him away, yeah. t- taking him gently to the grave. There's an acceptance of mortality in in it rather than a fleeing from mortality, and that's that's really worth noting. Yeah, she's not a, a monster in this, even though she had the stain on her and the stain moved to him. At the end, they're holding each other, saying that they love each other, and she seems to mean it. The, I guess the father represents death, and yeah. it's finally his time but, but, to but come. But she's, she's the progeny of death. That's where you get that mythological feel. Sure. It's, it's, like, it's straight out of the Greek myth, isn't it? But she's benevolent, even though she comes from death. There's another opposing idea, two opposing ideas held, held together simultaneously. This is a a wealth of delights in this story. It's so good. It's so creepy. It's provocative. I just, it's really great. Thank you for recommending this one as well, Jimmy. You, you picked this out for us, and I, I'm so glad you did. I really loved it. Oh, well, I'm glad that you both responded to it, because, yeah, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's a favorite of mine and a really beautiful piece of writing in and of itself. Uh, mm. Lyrical and poetic and moving and magical. Good story. Lyric poetical, moving all descriptions of the readings we had today by Greg Johnson. (laughs) 
He's a great guy, and I'm so glad to have him on the show and have him all month. We're going to do, uh, as we said, Professor Gildea, but we're also going to tackle the Aikman story, The Trains. Next up, after Gildea, we have Meeting Mr. Miller. Those are both other stories that you recommended, Jeremy, and we're going to take them on this month since it's a romance-themed Aikman month. I also want to thank <laughs> Fordell Research Unit. Please go to the Bandcamp page and pick up some of that. Lots of great stuff there. Yeah, I want to thank some of our patrons. Crypto Cartographer, thank you. Alistair Brooks, thank you. The Twins, thank you guys so much. Jason McKittrick, thanks. Angelina Brown, thank you. Evan, thanks so much. And Eric Gordon, my street pizza friend, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Those are our stakers, producers of these free shows. Again, folks, if you're interested in what we're doing here, please subscribe via our Patreon. But this one is for everybody. And of course, finally, we want to thank you, Jeremy, for coming on the show. Please, folks, pick up the book, The Warlock Effect. Thank you very much, guys, for having me. It's a pleasure as always. And with that, I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Jeremy Dyson. And you've been listening to Strange Studies of Strange Stories. At strangestudies.com and Patreon. Strange Studies of Strange Stories. Strange Studies of Strange Stories.